The Middle East conflict between the Palestinians and Israel has been raging for many years. Over the years, there were many attempts to negotiate a lasting peace, but all failed. Meanwhile, the toll of human life kept rising. Every year, every day, and sometimes every hour. Finally, there was a glimmer of hope, starting with the Madrid Conference in 1991. Two years later, in Oslo, Norway, after a long secret negotiation, an unprecedented declaration of principles was agreed upon, based on the exchange of land for peace. New hope seemed to be on the horizon. Together, today, with all our hearts and all our souls, we bid them shalom, salam, peace. There were many obstacles to peace. The status of five million Palestinian refugees scattered throughout the region, the borders between the two sides, and the future control of the borders with neighboring countries, the sharing of the world's holiest city, Jerusalem. But a major obstacle was advancing and this put Ramallah and Tel Aviv at odds. The Israeli colonies, or settlements, in the heart of Palestinian land. This obstacle was a direct threat to the guiding principle for the entire negotiation, land for peace. The Israeli settlement uh, policies started uh, almost with the beginning of the occupation. The different Israeli uh, governments had different understandings of the same concept of settlements. The first settlement in the West Bank had uh, been uh, constructed a few weeks after the 1967 war. That was the Kfar Etzion. A year later, a bit more than half a year later, 1968, um, a group of settlers had moved to Hebron. Uh, they had moved to, to Hebron uh, by the agreement back then, uh, which, had been, which had been done between them and the military. They were supposed to stay in Hebron only for a week and only during the Passover. Within two weeks after Israel conquered, already there were plans for settlements. There were plans for what we're going to keep. There were plans of giving Palestinian areas back to Jordan. The Jordanian option was the option of the Labour Party. So that the, the idea that this is our country, we've now grown our country. Now the trick is, how do we keep it and keep control of the land and make this all the land of Israel, but get rid of the Palestinian population? That, until today, from 1967 until today, remains the essential issue. Even those settlements were deeply rooted within the Zionist ideology no clear policy within the ruling Labour Party of Israel had been set on how to begin the settlement enterprise. All changed in 1974 with the formation of Gosh Emunim, the Bloc of the Faithful. The ideological settlement movement was born in the settlement of Kafar Etzion by some fundamentalist rabbis who claimed to be called by God to extend the borders of Israel from the Jordan to the sea. The ideology uh, is that Zionism and uh, the will of God coincide here on the land of Israel. That uh, this land was given to the Jewish people by God and nobody, no government, no individual has the right to give a piece of this land 
to anyone besides a Jew. Um, it comes from the ideology of Rabbi Cook, the Orthodox Zionism, uh, which uh, didn't have the opportunity in '48 to actually exercise this ideology because the original Zionism movement was secular. Gosh Emunim struggled to find its place within the primarily secular Israeli society and ruling Labour Party. But in 1977, with the election of Prime Minister Menachem Begin and his appointment of Ariel Sharon as Minister of Agriculture, they found their champions. The partnership between the hardline Begin and his settlement bulldozer, Sharon, changed the face of the occupied territory. By the time Mr. Begin left office in 1983, more than 100 settlements scattered throughout the occupied territory were now home to the most fundamentalist settlers. Sharon was appointed by Begin to be the head of the Ministerial Committee on Settlements. Sharon was charged by Begin with two things. One, to create facts on the ground, settlements, roads, infrastructure, everything, facts on the ground that make it impossible to disconnect the West, Judea and Samaria from Israel, to make Israel's presence irreversible, and secondly, to foreclose forever the establishment of a Palestinian state. The departure of Begin did not signal any significant change. His successor, Yitzhak Shamir, was a graduate in the same school of thought, hardline Zionism. In 1983, the Israeli Ministry of Agriculture and the World Zionist Organization published a master plan that called for 43 new settlements, 300 to 450 kilometers of new roads to connect and serve the settlements, and proposed quadrupling the number of settlement residents to 100,000. The successive Labour government, headed by Shimon Peres, continued building settlements. Settlement building is not the policy of the left or the right. It's the policy of Israel, no matter who is in office. One after the other, each and every Israeli Prime Minister since 1967, with no exceptions, contributed to the building up of settlements. Benjamin Netanyahu shocked the Palestinians when he decided to appropriate one of the most beautiful hills of the land for the settlement of Har Humar. This was the strongest signal to the Palestinians that Oslo was not working. Oslo did not manage to dismantle a single settlement. To the contrary, Israel was taking more Palestinian land. Ironically, after 1993 and the signing of the Oslo Agreement, Israeli policy toward the settlements took a drastic turn, which led to significant growth in the settlement's size and population. During the seven years following Oslo, the settler population within the West Bank increased by 90%. The sharpest increase occurred in the year 2000, during the term of Prime Minister Ehud Barak. In terms of uh, the population growth in the West Bank and in terms of construction of permanent houses, apartments, infrastructure in the West Bank, 
those years were actually the, the mid-90s, the years uh, after Oslo Agreement. When we were supposed to be building confidence, building trust between the two sides, to get to an end of conflict. However, Israel had something else completely in mind. They were trying to, to create facts on the ground in an unprecedented pace in order to dictate the outcome of the negotiations and not reach a negotiated settlement. Prime Minister Barak in Camp David, he was claiming he's giving everything, giving the moon. But what an ugly moon it was. Following international pressure to stop settlement construction, the Israeli government began new tactics. Under the pretext natural growth, they expanded and fattened the existing settlements and connected them to each other and to Israel. The result is huge blocks like the Ring of Settlements in Jerusalem and the blocks of Ariel and Gush Etzion, which slice the land and block any possibility of a contiguous Palestinian state. The mastermind of this policy is Prime Minister Ariel Sharon. The Israeli settlements started looking like a permanent occupation to the Palestinians. Hundreds of settlements and outposts scattered throughout occupied Palestine make the map of the West Bank look like Swiss cheese. The Israeli policy of creating permanent facts on the ground was working. Israel wants the world to see Judea and Samaria as an integral, natural part of the land of Israel, and then later of the state of Israel. And therefore, its policy is, def is, is, is um, defined as one that makes that reality permanent. This isn't a tactical thing. It's not that we're building settlements so we can be stronger. We're building settlements as permanent extensions of our cities. Ariel is an extension of Tel Aviv. Malay Adumim is an extension of, um, of Jerusalem. These settlements, along with their bypass road network and security zones, occupy about 42% of the land designated for the future Palestinian state. New road construction throughout the world generally means growth and better accessibility. In contrast, roads between settlements can only be travelled by settlers. For Palestinians to drive on these roads, they must obtain special permits, which are extremely hard to get. The basic human right of freedom of movement within one's own country has been taken away from the majority of Palestinians and considered a privilege for a select few. Here's where the highway system feeds in and the whole infrastructure, because you create a landscape in which, you know, you're in Malay Adumim, in the middle of the West Bank. Well, but with a beautiful highway, you can go to Malay Adumim, you can go home and back, you work in Jerusalem, home and back in 15 minutes, with a beautiful highway, never encounter an Arab, never, God forbid, you never go through an Arab village or neighborhood or anything else, you stay completely in a Jewish-Israeli environment. So you come from Jewish Jerusalem, you go down the beautiful Jewish highway through a Jewish landscape of the land of Israel, which is all idyllic because you don't see Arabs. You get into your Jewish dormitory suburb, go to your Jewish swimming pool at the end of the day, and everything is, everything is normal. It's banal. It's not an issue. It's not political at all. The locations of settlements are chosen carefully. Most are located on the tops of hills and between Palestinian towns and villages. The majority of these settlements have no proper sewage system, 
leaving their waste water to run through Palestinian agricultural land, causing great damage to the people and to the environment. Settlements squander valuable and needed natural resources, especially water. Water is an essential commodity in Palestine. The average consumption uh, per capita in Palestine, uh, in, in West Bank actually, uh, 140 cubic meter per capita a year, while the average consumption uh, for settlers uh, about 600 cubic meter per capita a year for all purposes. Uh, the Palestinians, they pay uh, four times more than the Israelis as cost of water uh, in West Bank, while we're using the same resources and the same infrastructure. And in other words, we consume five times less, but we pay four times more. There are now almost half a million Jewish settlers in occupied Palestinian territory. Israelis did not stand in line to be residents of the settlements. Residents were recruited, manipulated, and offered many incentives by each successive government of Israel. The main reason for me to buy a house here is economic, of course. A home, a house like this in Tel Aviv uh, would cost, uh, I think, double price. Uh, also, of course, the, there are bon bonuses. Uh, there are uh, more things, more uh, reasons to go to, to come to live here. Uh, the nice neighborhood, uh, it's, it is built nicely. It is quite new. The houses are not old. Um, there is wonderful view, wonderful air good air. But the main reason, of course, is economic. The government also gives incentives in very good conditions uh, for people who buy houses in the settlements. Most of the people, including my friends, including me a few years ago, as I said, are not aware of, the, of this fact, uh, living in occupied territories. And even they, if they are aware, they, they, they would like to forget it, not to think about it. What Israel did, especially Sharon, that was very smart, Sharon saw that there weren't enough ideological settlers. The religious settlers that really see this as the land of Israel and want to conquer it from the Arabs, there are not that many. And you couldn't, he couldn't get masses of Jews into the occupied territories on an ideological basis. So what he did is he disconnected ideology from settlement. So you have Male Adumim and Givad Ze'ev and Ariel and uh, Alfei Menasha, a lot of other cities that have nothing to do with settlement or politics. They're normal people living there. They don't even know, half of them, that they're across any kind of a green line, which has been completely eliminated from the Israeli maps. It's a big it's a big problem for me, in my eyes, that the people of Pisgat Zev don't even know uh, when a house is demolished uh, nearby and ten children are uh, without house, which happened uh, just uh, last year. Most of the people in Pisgat Zev don't know about it. And the few who do know about it, they don't care. I think a lot about the difference of my son and the conditions he, he lives in and the kids uh, a few hundred meters uh, nearby. And I even write about it in the neighborhood uh, uh, newspaper. And I would like people to open the, their eyes and to see these things. It's very hard, the, the sharp difference, geography and uh, in the mind between the refugee camp, just near, nearby here, and the people who live here, which uh, complain about uh, such uh, stupid things, like the, the garbage is not uh, moved uh, every day, but only every two days, or something like this. 
the government tricked us uh, for uh, buying a house here. As the government tricked uh, so many of uh, Israel uh, citizens. If the government offered me some apartment, uh, more or less like this, as I have now, in another place uh, in Israel, not in the occupied territories, uh, and that would make the peace um, um, closer, I would leave tomorrow. According to the Israeli group Peace Now, the overwhelming majority of settlers, 80% of them, consider themselves to be economic settlers. But the other 20% are ideological, hardcore, religious zealots. They are well armed and have no hesitation in using these arms. These ideological settlers chose to live deep in heavily populated Palestinian areas, especially the settlers down in Hebron, chose to live deep in Palestinian areas because that's where they would break the Palestinians, uh, that's where they would fragment their contiguity, surround them, lock them into islands, and create these, these pathways uh, between the settlements in Israel proper. The city of Hebron is now home to the most violent settlers. Hebron is no stranger to violence by the settlers. In 1994, an American-born Jewish doctor entered the Holy Mosque in Hebron and slaughtered 29 Palestinians at prayer. Today, Hebron is a city of 150,000 Palestinians under siege by 450 religious fanatics with an army to protect them. <laughs> In the 1980s, the Hebron settlers decided to venture out of their settlements and move into the city itself. The Palestinian neighborhood of Tel Rumeida was their target. The people of Tel Rumeida endure all kinds of settler violence and harassment intended to force Palestinians to leave their homes and their land. They are in a constant state of siege, curfews and checkpoints. According to the United Nations, there are 181 checkpoints in the Hebron area. It's difficult and often dangerous to travel from home to work to the market to visit friends and family the brutality of the settlers and the occupation that comes with them prompted some former Israeli soldiers to break the silence and speak out to their own society and to the world about their experience in Hebron. We're walking there in streets that only Jews could walk in the streets. The Palestinians couldn't go out of their houses. They were under curfew. And there are certain streets in Hebron that were only for Jews. The street is cleaned from Palestinians. 
And I remember myself walking in these streets. It was uh, an holiday, a, Jew a Jewish holiday, and the city was full of thousands of Jews. And we're walking in the middle of a Palestinian city that has 150,000 Palestinians in the city, and all what, we see, all what we see when we're patrolling there is Jews. We didn't see one Palestinian for hours. And I didn't understand what's going on around me, why everything is closed, why, why it looks like a Jewish city. And when I started to, to talk with the settlers there, so that the answer I got is that this is the way everyone should look. As you see here, the playground of my kids. As you see, it's a jail, not playground, but we call it playground because my kids, they play here, and because they, they go outside, they will be in dangerous. They will be attacked by the slurs, and also by soldiers, they don't care. They play here because if they go outside, they will feel uh, afraid because always they are attacked by stones and by uh, uh, glass bottles. They throw it at their kids when they play at the road, so they should come and we use this fence to protect them from the stones. Because when we were sit here, also we was attacked by the settlers. And the soldiers, they can protect the settlers only. It's our fault or our, our, our crime just because we are a Palestinian and we want, did not want to, to leave this house. The real situation behind the headlines of the newspapers. What I did in Hebron every night, shooting, firing uh, grenades into a Bosnina neighborhood, that's what the Israeli press called IDF forces returned fire to the, force of, to the source of fire. I don't remember once that I recognized the source of fire. People just argued. I mean, I want to shoot. No, I want to shoot. No, I want to shoot. They just like stood in line behind the grenade machine gun in order to shoot the grenades for something like uh, 2,000 meters at Khalid Sheikh. I mean, civilized neighborhood, and you can't see shit. I mean, it's night, and you don't see any snipers. You don't see nothing. You just see buildings, and you feel like it's inside of a computer game. And then, and then your mother calls you to see if you're okay. You can tell her that this is what you've been doing. I mean, and she hears the shots, and all the noise of the explosions in Hebron. And you said it's just like, uh, no, it's okay, just a drill. The Israeli society has no clue about what's going on in Hebron, what's going on in all the occupied territories. The, care, the closure, curfews, it's the most, the most something, uh, it kills us. Always we have here a curfew. Any problems in all of Hebron, we have a curfew here. Believe me, if we hear an explosion in London, we have here in Tel Ramed, we have a curfew here. The story of the settlers' violence in Hebron is an untold story that most media outlets, including Israeli media, would not dare to cover due to the settlers' hostility towards them. The city of Hebron is losing its residents 
at an alarming pace, especially in the old city. Walking the streets of Hebron, you would think you were walking in a ghost town. Before the settlers invaded, the city was a major tourist attraction due to its holiness for Jews, Christians and Muslims as the burial place of the patriarchs. But now, the city is experiencing an organized process aimed at forcing the Palestinians out of their homes. Sitting on a post on the roof and hearing drilling from the under of you inside the, the settlers' houses, and you call on the radio, you call the patrol, and you say, I hear it drills under me. Please check what it is. And the patrol comes in the middle of the night and he founds a, a settler that decided to expand their, his, uh, his, uh, his living room. So he drilled into the wall. He broke into a Palestinian shop. We have the same wall. He threw everything that was in the shop to the street. He locked the doors. And now he has a bigger house. No one is, not, no one is arresting him. No one is stopping him. The police in Hebron is afraid from the settlers. It's frightening. I mean, it's really frightening to, to live here um, when your neighbors want you uh, gone. They want your land. Uh, they want your home. And they're willing to intimidate and to threaten uh, until they get their way. And the army and the police, the security apparatus, the Israeli security apparatus that is here is primarily mandated to protect them. They're armed. They're violent. There's been years and years of absolutely unrestrained settler violence. A settler can kill a Palestinian with impunity, with no fear whatsoever of ever being tried or brought to court or anything. And I've witnessed this with my own eyes. Settlers can go, and I witness this as well, into Palestinian houses and, and take over the houses or come in and burn the house down with the police all around. How can you do to other people what was done to you people? You know, uh, just 60 years ago. You know, I visited uh, South Africa recently and I spoke to uh, black people who still remember the apartheid. This is the South African apartheid. This is Rhodesia. Uh, actually, the, the Palestinians, in the best case, are transparent. They don't see them. They don't exist. The latest chapter of the Israeli policy, and especially that of Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, father of the settlement movement, is in its final instalment to create permanent facts on the ground and shape the future of the Palestinian state. In June 2002, Israel decided to encircle the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, with a wall or a fence, depending on who you ask. The International Court of Justice calls it a wall. In some areas, it is indeed a 25-foot-high concrete wall, while in other areas, it is a fence surrounded by razor wire, trenches, patrol roads and surveillance cameras. Palestinians call it an apartheid wall, Israelis call it a security fence. You can't explain the major elements of the occupation by security. You can't explain 200 settlements by security. Israel did not go out and build Mali Adumim for security reasons. And it never claimed to. You can't explain the highway system. Uh, you can't explain the policy of house demolitions. You can't explain land expropriation. You can't explain really the closure the way it's done, because most of the closure is internal within the West Bank and within Gaza, not between them and Israel. And you can't explain the root of the wall by security. Security simply does not explain these things. Something else is going on. 
just look at the root of the wall and the picture definitely will become clearer. The border between Palestine and Israel, between the Palestinian territories and the Israeli territories, is 315 kilometers long. Meanwhile, the root of the wall is 670 kilometers. Definitely, it is more than double the length. Why? The district of Kalkilia is home to about 100,000 Palestinians and boasts some of the richest agricultural land in the West Bank. But Kalkilia has been walled in so that Israel can annex the Israeli settlements around the district. Look at what's happened to the city and surrounding villages, how they've been choked, cut off from each other, Palestinian from Palestinian, caged in by surrounding walls and fences, separated from their livelihood, their land. The farmers of Kalkilia have become landless. An olive tree takes between 7 to 10 years to bear a fruit. And the Israeli bulldozers uproot it and steal it in a minute. The tree for us as a Palestinians is a life. We will keep planting and we will keep on living. The wall, of course, does not stop in Kalkilia. Its path continues 22 kilometers deep inside the West Bank, encircling and annexing the settlement block of Ariel. The Ariel block splits the West Bank into almost two pieces. It creates small enclaves of isolated Palestinian communities and destroys any chance of having a future contiguous state of Palestine. The wall continues its path, encircling and annexing more settlements and more Palestinian land, while devastating many farming communities in its path. Hundreds of thousands of olive trees have been uprooted. 35,000 metres of irrigation network destroyed. More than 40 water wells lost. In the path of the wall, there were many trees, many homes, many farms, many people. And every one of them has its own story. The story of the wall is a long and painful one and it continues on to the city most devastated by the wall, Jerusalem, and its twin city, Bethlehem.
Upon completion of the wall in Jerusalem, tens of thousands of Palestinians will find themselves outside the walls of the city, cut off from their city and their livelihood. By doing this, Israel will have succeeded in changing the demographic makeup of the holy city. It's heartbreaking what's happening in Jerusalem. You know, at the beginning of this year, it took us months to figure out how to send thousands of children to their schools and teachers to their classes. The walls zigzag in and around Jerusalem, Jews in and Palestinians out. Mothers unable to reach hospitals to deliver their babies, children unable to reach their schools, Muslims and Christians unable to reach their holy places to worship. It is a war against our existence that Israel is waging. Settlements and the wall are the tools to achieve their obsession of Judaizing the place. Israel is using its settlements to fragment the Palestinian presence in Jerusalem, to destroy East Jerusalem as a coherent urban and economic entity, and in that way to destroy the economic heart of any Palestinian state. Um, you have it's like an onion. You have concentric circles of settlements. You have huge settlement cities. You have more Israelis living today in Palestinian East Jerusalem in settlements than you have Palestinians. And here is where Jerusalem is really the, the heart of the struggle, in a sense. Because without Jerusalem, you don't have a viable Palestinian state. And, uh, and without the settlements around Jerusalem, uh, Israel can't really control the entire area that it wants to control forever. So Jerusalem is really the key. The town of Jesus has its own story. Israel surrounded Bethlehem with a concrete wall, confiscating half of its land and placing that land on the Israeli side of the wall for the future expansion of the surrounding settlements. I wonder what Jesus would say if he sees his town as a ghetto behind walls and gates oppressing people, taking their land and depriving them of their dignity will never bring security to anybody. If I have anything to say to our neighbors and to the Jewish people, please do come back to your senses. Think of justice. Justice is not a foreign concept for Jews or for Judaism. Let my people free. The wall snakes south of Bethlehem, encircling and annexing the huge block of settlements, Gush Etzion, and other scattered settlements along the Green Line, the border. Upon the completion of the wall, Israel will have succeeded in annexing more than 80% of its settlers and their settlements into Israel. Since 1947, Palestinians have painfully watched, year after year, the partition, occupation and annexation of their land and their country. The dream of freedom and statehood is as elusive as ever. Settlements and their master designers are confiscating the land and ultimately at the end of each day and each year confiscating the human rights of millions of Palestinians. Settlements are destroying the principle that is the very foundation of the peace process. Land for peace and creating a land with no peace. It would be very hard uh, to argue that the two-state solution is still alive, if by that we mean a viable Palestinian state. A continuous uh, uh, Palestinian state 
is going to be practically impossible. And this is going to be not only the end of the dream of Palestinians of a state, but it might also affect the Israeli dream uh, of the survival of Israel uh, as a Jewish state. They are asking themselves a simple question. Is Israel is willing to acknowledge our historical collective rights in 22% of historical Palestine? The answer is, according to what Israel has done, and this is something which each Palestinian has seen. If not from his door, then from his window. If not from his window, from his roof. The answer is no. Now, Israel still wants a two-state solution because we still have the same dilemma we started out with. How do we keep control of the country but get rid of the Palestinians? At the end of the day, uh, as uh, Prime Minister Shamir used to say, they will get used to it. They will get used to the facts on the ground. They could confiscate our land, destroy our homes, uproot our trees, and imprison us. But they will never be able to imprison spirit seeking for freedom. Walls and ghettos will never bring peace. Justice will. In my lifetime, if uh, you know, I get uh, to live uh, long enough, like Shima Perez, uh, I may be present uh, to celebrate it. But if it won't happen in my lifetime, I'm afraid my children um, will have to forget about it. I spent a good number of years of my life in Israeli jails. Though I never hurt anybody, never attacked anyone, never even touched a gun. The only crime I ever committed is to dream of freedom and statehood for myself, for my kids. Now, after all those years, the state Sharon has in mind for me and my kids is a bunch of enclaves, cantons, ghettos. It is hard to be optimistic given the circumstances we live under. However, I am. You know, if 70 years ago you would have asked the Jewish people themselves if they ever thought the nightmare of Nazism would be over, they probably would have laughed at you. But Nazism was defeated. And look at Israel now, a strong state, prospering. Now I'm sure Palestinians will be no exception to that. One day we will be free, I have no doubt. Definitely we will be free, no doubt whatsoever. You ask me how it is that I dare to take a side You say I loathe myself, pointing out that you have lied You say it's tribal warfare, but I disagree For the dynamics of the situation are not difficult to see On the one side is the fighter jet, on the other is the stone On the one side is the slave, on the other is the throne For the many there are checkpoints, while foreign soldiers rule the streets For the one side there is victory, but the people don't accept defeat the word you need to know is occupation The very definition of a land without a nation And if peace is what you're after, then let us not deceive It'll come on the day the tanks return to Tel Aviv On the one side there is hunger and bulldozed olive trees On the other is the army by decrees, caterpillars in all the streets, destroy whole city blocks while children swallow shrapnel for the crime of throwing rocks. Fences are erected around the towns they flatten, and hurt own fanatics sleep on sheets of satin, and they water their plantations, drilling ever deeper wells, while the displaced children of the hopeless are filled with bullet shells. The word you need to know is occupation, the very definition of a land without a and if peace is what you're after, then let us not deceive. It'll come on the day the settlers return.